In the next two videos, we'll see how to implement a save system, starting with the settings and then saving the game state. I've used the example from the previous tutorial where we would detect if enemies are in a character's field of view. The drawing colors for the visual debug mode are configured in the settings. I'm using a configuration file that looks like that, and that's entirely managed in Godot. I'll show you the script signature in Visual Studio so I can fold the methods. We have a dictionary that contains some categories, and each category is a dictionary itself with the key and value for the settings. So it reflects that structure where we have a category in the config file in brackets, then we have a key, and to that key we assign a value. Godot can serialize any core type, like the colors. This means that it will convert variables that you have in memory at runtime to some data that represents it on the disk. So here's how it works. We have a config file that's going to be our configuration.cfg file. We're going to store it in the resources folder just so that we have it in the project folder. But when you build the final game, you'll want to use the user path instead of resource. User will make sure that it's stored somewhere where you can always save the file on the user's computer, regardless of the system you use, whether it's on Linux, Windows, or Android. For this script, we'll mainly need to do two things. Save and load the settings. I'm using a loop to loop through the dictionary and serialize the values using the config file and the get value method on the config file object. To test out your code as you go, I invite you to download the demo project. That way you can change any value like I'm doing here in the settings and it will reflect in the game. You can change the color of the detect area when you're not detecting anything and the color of the vectors as well. Before we code our save and load mechanism on the settings, we have to load them in the level. To do that, we could add them manually to a node in the scene tree, the top node. The thing is, with everything that's related to saves, we want the class to be available all the time. The player might want to reload something or change a setting wherever he is. For that, Godot features the autoload. It allows you to add a script that's loaded before anything else in the game and that's available on every single scene. To add one, you have to go to Scene and to your Project Settings, then to the Autoload tab. You'll have to give a path to the script and add it. Once it's added to the list and the singleton is enabled, these settings will automatically be created before you start to initialize the level, so before any of the nodes are created. Meaning that once we add the two methods to save and load the data, it will be available for the game. Now if you try the game with the demo, it will already work because I've added some default settings in the dictionary. That's what this dictionary is for. The config file for now doesn't exist, it's completely empty. We'll use Godot's config file class to save and retrieve our settings. This one offers a few methods to generate a config file, just like the config.cfg you can find in every project. Using the get and set value functions, you give it a section, a key, and a value. It will create just that. It will find the section between brackets, find the corresponding key, or if there's none, it will create it put the equal sign and set the value there. Now in our save settings, we want to loop through the dictionary. The dictionary is what is actually holding the settings at runtime and that is also where we will modify them. So when you save, you get all those settings that were modified by the player and you call the save function that will serialize them, that will convert them to data that you can store on the disk. To do that, we'll have to use a nested loop because we first have the first level of the dictionary, the first set of keys, audio and debug. These are sections. And we have to go one level deeper to get the actual key and value pairs that will store our settings. So let's go to the save settings function and start with a first for loop to get the section. 
Ball section in the settings dictionary. We'll use the keys method to get all the keys there. So in this for loop, you will first get the audio and then the debug value inside of section. Once we have that, we need another for loop to get the next set of keys down the dictionary. We will get the keys in the settings dictionary, but then we'll use the section key to access the second level. Now, if we follow the for loops, the section will first be audio. The key will be mute at that stage. So on the first iteration, we will have audio and mute that will allow us to get the mute value. On the second iteration, the section will become debug. Then the key will become vector color. And on the third iteration, the key will become area color here and the section will still be debug. With those two loops, we can add any amount of categories and settings to the dictionary and the save will work automatically. You could hard code everything, but it doesn't scale well. With this code snippet, you will be able to port it from one game to the next and it will work out of the box. Now the settings dictionary holds all the values at runtime. This is where we will modify them whenever the player changes a setting. And once the player is done, we can save them. And that is the role of the config file. Inside the config file, we'll use the set value method. With the set value, you have to pass a section, a key, and a value. That's exactly what we have. So we have the section, the key, and then we'll just have to add the value. For the value, we have to dive two levels deep inside the dictionary using the audio and mute key, for example, to get this global value. Use the settings dictionary, the section key for the first level and the key for the second level. Now, all we have left to do once we did that is to save the data. For that, the config file has a method called save and you just have to give it a path. The path is stored at the top of the script. It's the root of the project folder and config.cfg. Let's run the game and see what we get. If I go to the file system, now I have a config.cfg file and if I open it, here's what inside. We have the audio and debug categories and then the key value pairs we wanted to store. So two colors and a Boolean value. Loading the settings is a little trickier. We first have to open the file, check if it opened correctly, then retrieve all the values from it and store them in the settings. Let's first open the file. So for that, we'll have to use the config files load method. There again, we have to give it a path to grab the config file from. Now, loading a file might not work at some points, so you don't want to do anything else if the loading failed for some reason. To know if it did, we'll store the error code or the return code in a variable called error. If everything went well, the load method will return the OK code. So if the error is equal to something other than OK, we'll return out of the function. And on top of that, we might want to print the error code. So we can say we failed loading the settings file and the error code is error. Now we have to get all the values from the config file. To know what the sections and keys are, we'll reuse the settings dictionary. The only thing is we'll get the categories and the various keys inside those categories, but we'll grab the values not from our dictionary, we'll grab them from the file. We can copy the two nested loops up there, we'll reuse them, it's the same idea. But then the values will come from the config file. We'll use the get value method. And then we have to give it a section and a key. So the section will be the section and the key, the key from our two for loops. There's a third parameter we have to pass in in case the get value method doesn't find anything in the config file. This will give you a default value. 
Now we want to load all those values from the config file to the settings dictionary. To do that, we'll do just like we did above. We'll use the section and key to access the right value. Now this is a pretty hard-coded function. It will work for simple projects. We could always refactor it to make it a bit more pure. We could force the user to pass in the path every time he calls the function. And instead of storing the values directly in the dictionary, we might just build a dictionary and return it. How can we try to see if it works? In the ready function, both methods get called save and load settings. One thing we can do is remove the call to save settings, comment it out, and then we will print our settings dictionary. Now the problem is we saved our config file once, it's available, it's on the file system, and the values are exactly the same as the ones set by default in the script. We have to modify them somehow to see a change in the game. You can modify a color, and if you try out the game, you will see it's not a dark purple anymore. Now it's a really, really bright pink, meaning that our values get properly loaded. This type of config files should work well on any system, and it's particularly useful for very simple games. If you only have some values to store, or you want to leave these settings at the player's disposal, something that you can edit with a text editor, you can use this file format. It's also quite useful for tools that you would make for yourself or for the community. In the next video, we'll go one step further and we'll see how to save the game for a slightly bigger project. Nothing huge, but a system that will scale better than this one if you're making an RPG, an adventure game or something like that. See you tomorrow.